Uh, first is uh, Andrew Hoppen, who is here from Albany. Um, Ian uh, Jacobs and um, Ben Carlos from Open Government. We're going to do panels of three, and that's the first panel. Whomever would like to start, go right ahead. Sure. Thank you very much, Councilman and uh, Councilman and guests. Um, I'm Andrew Hoppen. I'm the Chief Information Officer of the New York State Senate and i um, honored to have been invited to testify here today. I'm going to speak contemporaneously and I'll have prepared remarks that will be turned in uh, later today. Um, I'm not really going to rehash the, the rationale for open data. I think um, Mayor Bloomberg this morning and, and uh, Councilman Brewer have eloquently uh, stated why it's so important. What I will say is, and what I will speak to is our experience in the Senate uh, with why it's been uh, important and um, how we think that may translate across different government entities. Uh, we, everything we do out of my office relates to transparency, efficiency, and participation in government. And we found that while people often think of open data as being fundamental primarily for the purposes of government transparency, we found it's as fundamental for government efficiency, even within our own enterprise and also for citizen participation in government. It's really the, the DNA for all of these things. And so in that regard, uh, the first point I'd like to make is that I, I would encourage the council to think of other government ent entities as a customer here, as well as the public. Uh, we often in the Senate need to make use of data as part of our policy analysis and policy making process that is not our data. And to the extent that other government entities at the city level, at the federal level, other state level entities uh, publish data openly in an easy to access and easy to use format, that assists us with our work. Um, so please consider other government entities as a customer. And that can, en that can enhance our efficiency as a body of government entities working together. Um, also, uh, when you think about openness and data, I would encourage you to think also about openness in terms of the software code that may be written to make use of this data. Uh, open data with, uh, can be the tip of the iceberg, really, in terms of the work required um, to actually make good use of that data. And so the extent that tax dollars are invested in uh, doing work to make data useful, I would encourage the council to consider how to make the results of that work on software code as open as the data that uh, goes into those applications. And then finally, uh, openness in terms of communication. I think the uh, awareness of the availability of data, the, uh, the user stories about how data is successfully made use of, um, and the ability to learn from one another across different levels of, of government. Uh, really all comes still through human beings communicating with each other, whether online or offline. And so all of the, the roadmaps, the plans, the deliberations, the uh, successes, the failures that relate to the opening up of government data, I hope will be uh, thought of as being fundamental and open uh, uh, public records as well so that we can all learn from each other. Um, so openness about, of code, communication, and data is, is my second point. Um, the third is that uh, in this context of the Senate, I'd like to speak a little bit to the debate we, we just heard between sort of the offering of applications that are of uh, immediate and evident utility to citizens as versus publishing a lot of raw data online. At least in our context, we haven't seen there to be any conflict between those two. Um, one example is our effort to publish legislation uh, that we're working on online, we have both a uh, search interface, which is quite refined and easy for citizens to use, we think, to search for bill information. We also, on open.nysenate.gov, publish the raw feeds of that data and an API so you can actually write your own applications to build the sorts of search interfaces that any individual stakeholder might want for their own particular use case. Because uh, we don't believe that we can do a sufficiently good job of meeting every use case for every uh, subset of our constituency sufficiently. So we want to push the power to do that out to uh, as many people as possible while still trying to do the baseline good job that we need to do for the uh, most widespread use cases that, that we encounter. Um, so that's my third point. I don't think there's a conflict between raw publishing of data and delivering really value, high, highly refined value-added services to, to citizens. Uh, the fourth point I would make is that um, I think citizen participation is a really key part of this, uh, and it can actually help to uh, 
bridge the gap between viability um, and uh, the desire to, to, to publish everything being uh, potentially quite expensive. Um, we have a lot of human beings in the state who have uh, time and talent on their hands, and there have been some good examples, I think, at the federal level of how you can use crowdsourcing applications to actually have empower citizens to actually add value to raw data and make it a more refined and therefore more useful data product. Um, in the UK, we saw an example recently of the Guardian newspaper taking, uh, you know, literally scanned records of expenses uh, incurred by members of parliament and going through and looking at those expenses and actually processing them into a structured data, taking unstructured data, turning it into structured digital data. Um, well, that uh, particular case may or may not be of interest at the, at the city level. Um, we, I think, have uh, seen time and again that if you've got something that's too labor intensive for government to do, there are now ways that we can employ citizens uh, being of public service themselves uh, in order to actually work with data and add value to it and republish it through government. So citizen participation in crowdsourcing is my fourth point. Um, and then my fifth point would be uh, just that I, I think that the way, obviously there's a, there's, there are legitimate points of debate here and um, I find myself conflicted on some of the issues that, that were debated uh, here um, over the last half hour. Um, what I think is key in terms of implementing this coming up with uh, good legislation if indeed it's implemented and however open data in the city of New York goes forward is that the process around doing it remain open. Uh, it's fantastic to have this this hearing. I hope that the views of, of the people, the views of, of the city uh, administration and agencies and the views of other government entities are represented consistently throughout this process. Um, not just in the consideration of a bill but actually through the course of of opening up data. Um, you know, I think there's a, a timeline all the way through, is it uh, 2012 or 2013, through which agencies would, would be uh, potentially um, opening up their data. And, and throughout that process, I think it's going to be important to have all those voices represented as agencies figure out how to open up their data, publish their roadmaps about how to do it, uh, test what works, learn from each other about what works and doesn't. Um, and we in the Senate would very much like to hope to be uh, invited to be part of that ongoing debate. Um, and in turn to, divide, uh, to, to invite you to do the same as we look to how to open up the subset of state data which we work with uh, directly. Um, to that end, I do hope that there's a, a, a role for uh, not only do it, but an entity within the city that represents the voice of, of the people as you go forward into this. Um, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. I want to thank you in particular because there's a lot going on in Albany and I appreciate your being here because I think you're the voice of reason for the State Senate. Thank you. <laughs> no comment. Good afternoon. Good government, transparency, and community advocates. Council members Lapin, Gonzalez, James, Lou, and de Blasio, thank you for recognizing the importance of this issue and for sponsoring this introduction. Council member Brewer, Thank you for chairing this committee, for being, the, for being the first to propose this kind of groundbreaking legislation for today's advocacy, and most of all, for being an amazing legislature and a role model for so many in the city. My name is Benjamin Kalos. I'm here before you today as co-founder of the Open Government Foundation, a New York State not-for-profit which aims to bring greater transparency, accountability, and openness to government by making information available online for all to see. Government is like any one of us because it's comprised of so many of us and it's subject to the same sickness and disease. Unlike us, we know the cure for most of the government's worst ailments and maladies. If we may be the first of many to quote him today, Justice Louis Brandeis famously wrote, publicity is justly commended as a remedy for social and industrial diseases. Sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, the electric light, the most efficient policeman. Transparency and openness and government should be likened to medicine or a vaccine. Like Buckley's, a medicine taken to cure recurring ailment like a cough, it tastes awful and it works. Like a vaccine, dreading the shot is often worse than the shot itself. We have all acknowledged the value of vaccines requiring measles, mumps, rubella, amongst others for all children who attend public schools. We must make sure elected and appointed officials get a similar vaccine against corruption. While transparency might cause momentary pain, as when member item for information was recently released and scandal uncovered. New reforms were created to avoid future corruption, leaving both city council members and New York City healthier in the long run. I'm going to uh, skip the next piece of the uh, testimony as it... Uh, Go to some of your suggestions. That would be great. Okay. Uh, 
If I may, I'd like to just go over our experience as a okay. not-for-profit with a FOIL. Sure. Uh, earlier this year, our foundation sent a Freedom of Information Law request to New York State Assembly and Senate, as well as New York City Council. FOIL is the only means for good government groups and reporters, let alone citizens, to gain access to most government information. It is worth mentioning that most of this information must be made available within 5 to 20 days, and paper records often have a statutory cost of 25 cents per page. In our experience, the New York State Assembly followed the FOIL to the letter, quickly responded within five days, a uh, statutory timeline, quickly delivered an electronic copy of every single bill and vote since 1995, which we promptly po posted online at newyork.openlegislation.org. The New York State Senate has since delivered committee voting information for 2007 and 2008, which is also promptly posted on the same site. Uh, with, with a small addition, uh, you made a point regarding RSS feeds and alerting people as to what type of information was happening. Our foundation has already created a data.gov tweets, which is a Twitter account, so that people who are interested in what's being posted at data.gov can get it on their Twitter feed. We've also created RSS feeds for various types of legislative bill actions so that you can get a feed in XML. Uh, showing when a bill that you're following or certain bills have made it out of committee or are being voted on. Right. Although both le legislative bodies have been cooperative, many state legislative records remain in paper form. For example, the New York State Assembly's committee votes for 2008 number 5,356 pages, and at the previously mentioned statutory 25 cent per page uh, will cost $1,339. While the state legislature has been compliant, the New York City Council has requested 90 days just to respond to the same request, and our appeal detailing how the city council could and should comply with the FOIL was recently denied. There are many instances where government bodies have demonstrated bad faith in compliance, requiring litigation to release public information, costing government and those exercising their rights hundreds of thousands. While some critics of open government or this legislation might argue that freedom of information and open meetings law provides for sufficient access, we would simply point to our current interaction with this very institution where transparency, accountability, and openness remain blocked while we wait three months for a response that the law dictates and other legislative bodies have demonstrated should take no more than five to 20 days. In fact, in our foundation's efforts to set legislation free, we've learned that government has incentivized itself to keep information secret. The government generates information that has value by virtue of the fact that affects constituents. The government then pays a vendor to help it internally manage that information. At the same time as that vendor is getting paid by the government, the vendor, vendor becomes the only source of that data in manageable form. The vendor then licenses access to the public who need it so badly that they're willing to pay for it. We've been advised that should the state legislature begin using our website or should they implement our free source code, it would save millions a year in management fees and eliminate costs in the tens of millions currently paid by the public to a vendor to gain access to the same information that should be made free by the government rather than a not-for-profit. In an open, free democracy, it shouldn't be up to the government to decide what information is important enough to be released to the citizens for free. Instead, all non-private data should be released in its entirety, and citizens should be empowered to decide what information they will consume, when they will consume it, how, where, and why. Our mission is simple. Wherever government neglects to release critical data to the public, whether through apathy, indifference, or impracticability, we will step in and use every means available to release information for free ourselves. When Councilmember Brewer sent out a call for testimony that was rightfully distributed widely throughout the open government internet communities, asking the internet community to help highlight the advantage to web developers if there was city data available in open data format. Given our recent experience, having developed a website for state data and wishing to develop a website for city data, our foundation heard this call loudly and clearly. And can you just summarize, you're doing great. Can you summarize the rest? Sure. Of uh, the, the suggestions are, are next and I'll mm -hmm. wrap up quickly. Data must be available over the internet in accordance with the eight principles of open data to facilitate development because it, in its absence, three problems virtually preclude any developers from building websites or applications to benefit New York City. First, if the data is not available over the internet, developers can't aggregate it because it isn't there to collect. If the data is not freely available over the internet, it requires burdensome technical, lengthy, and expensive FOIA requests discussed earlier. 
Second, if the data is not open data format, developers won't be able to use it to create websites or applications. Again, developers are in technical specialized fields and they like presenting technical information to a user in a simple and useful way. Many developers don't like to parse through flat files that result from FOIL requests. This poorly formatted data only presents yet another obstacle to making New York City's data useful. Our foundation can testify that data obtained through a FOIL request must be parsed into a format that can be easily manipulated by website or application, which is time consuming, difficult, and requires an esoteric skill set that is in common even in the most dedicated developer. Third, without strong legislation, government agencies are extremely unlikely to do what this introduction would require of their own accord. Our experience has shown that government is slow to take initiative and sometimes seeks to avoid compliance with existing FOIA law. Once your introduction is passed into local law, it will encounter similar resistance and compliance like FOIL. Our foundation recommends adding a self-enforcing provision aside from litigation to provide remedies to citizens, good government groups and journalists for failed compliance, which would state that city agencies may not charge FOIL statutory fee for any records produced in exclusively phys uh, physical paper form after July 4th, 2010. Without this legislation and strong incentive for compliance, New York City will not be leading our nation with open data standards, let alone keeping up with national trends. Thank you again for considering the adoption of open standards. We look forward to working with the City Council to make open data a reality in both the short and long term. Thank you very Thank you. much. And we'll certainly talk to the General Council about the lack of FOIL responses. So we will check on that. Next. Hello. Hello. My name is Ian Jacobs. It's a great pleasure to be invited to speak today. It's a little bit by accident. I uh, was here for other reasons, was invited to the hearing, and it turns out the organization I represent is mentioned by name in the proposal, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. Yep. I'm the head of communications for the W3C, and I'm thrilled to hear uh, about the proposal. Uh, just a quick word on W3C. We were founded in 1994 by Tim Berners-Lee, who's the inventor of the World Wide Web. And, and uh, data is a great passion of his, especially these days. And uh, our mission is to create standards that are open and available for free uh, to make the web available to all, anywhere, on any device. We, uh, so some of the standards you may recognize include XML and HTML, but right now we have a new uh, developing stack of standards for data called the Semantic Web. Um, some of them you may not have heard of yet, like RDF and SCOS and OWL. Uh, but we have been developing these standards for open data for 10 years, since 1998, I think, was the first standard, uh, RDF, and have been developing communities to help make the best use of uh, these standards, these open standards, um, including, for example, the healthcare and life sciences activity. More recently, the e-government activity has really caught on fire. And um, so we have an active interest group where people can uh, participate and learn and contribute to best practices for putting data on the web. So it seems to speak exactly to the problem you mean to address in the proposal. Uh, so I have, I'm happy to provide other information about how we operate in our public uh, accountability process ourselves and anything you'd like to know about the standards. But um, I had just a couple of words about the, the proposal which I just read upon arriving. Um, I think it's, of course, uh, the perfect answer to use these open standards for data longevity and for cost reasons. And to build one web, I heard a cry for open for raw data now, which Tim Berners-Lee uh, had the audience chanting at the TED lecture uh, earlier this year out in California. Um, as far as the cost of doing this, um, it seems like a good way to start is to put up the data that's already available electronically um, using these open formats. Again, Tim Berners-Lee recently published a uh, document uh, uh, in response to a request from the Obama administration about how to put data on the web. So that's available as of last week. And I can share that URL with some people if they're interested. Um, one thing that raised uh, an orange flag for me was the uh, requirement for a central portal. Uh, points of centralization tend to s cause blockages and it would seem that it would both lower costs and make life easier for people if they could sort of publish their data independently and then it could be aggregated by any number of sites. I heard uh, the chair speak in favor of RSS feeds and that sort of thing. So I think aggregation is a good way to help reduce the cost and to sort of free up each agency to publish what it has at the speed that it's capable of doing and to establish collaboratively good practices for doing so. 
Uh, and again, I would, W3C is very, very interested in the participation of governments internationally, but we recognize their sort of needs uh, at, at different levels. I appreciated the, 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 the comment about interagency and intra-agency needs. Uh, so we have an open forum and welcome participation and, and help in building these good practices. So I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you all very much. Um, one question I have is, um, where do you, we did mention just, you know, in our legislation that there would be more difficult data and easier to put up data. So we sort of, along the same lines that you just described, is that we would ask that the data that's available go up. So I think we're thinking along the same, the same lines because um, there are some legacy systems that might take uh, longer. Um, when you have talked to other cities or the federal government or maybe other countries, particularly in your role, have you found that some of the roadblocks that you heard discussed today have appeared, or is it a are we are they able to get this data up in the format that our bill outlines? So I have not participated actively in those discussions. I'm happy to have one of my colleagues uh, in the interest group talk to you about okay. that. Um, the one uh, the one comment I did hear was that some of the uh, state governments uh, were nervous about. Uh, things like RSS feeds, they they were not as as uh, as up to date in technology as maybe the federal government was. I have no way to back up that statement, but that was one comment that I heard. Um, I also know that uh, people have invested a lot in XML and may be wondering, wait, we invested in XML. What's the difference, and why should we go to RDF? And uh, without belaboring the technical details. I think RDF, it turns out, is easier to merge with other data. They're, for technical reasons, it's just much easier to, to put it together with, with uh, and create mashups, which I heard was one of the big goals. So uh, getting from XML to RDF is quite simple, but uh, uh, that, that was one of the, the comments that I heard. Okay. Um, in Albany, do you find that there are other le state legislatures that are trying to do what you're doing? I mean, is there any kind of discussion going on around the country as to what different legislatures are doing? You probably need the microphone. So we, we have asked and we have um, begun to form a de facto community of practice with our peers in other states. Um, we've not found that uh, formal processes and specifications that we hoped would exist that would make our jobs easier did already exist. We went to the National Council of State Legislatures to talk about uh, taxonomy for legislative data so that you could look up a marriage equality bill in one state and know that you're also able to find the analogous bill from another state at the same time. Um, that has not been done to our knowledge and we're hoping to set a standard and again by doing it in an open way all the way along publishing our roadmap, inviting other people to critique and, and add to it that will set a standard that won't be just good for us but good for other states and we're actually putting up a wiki that will help uh, other states to publish their analogous experiences alongside ours so we can all learn from each other. So I think at a city level, there's a direct analog as well in terms of if you figure something out, help other cities to leverage off that good work and, and vice versa. Yeah, National League of Cities would be the place to go. Um, back to the issue of the portal. Um, I think that we have 80 city agencies here. That's a lot. And I think that when you talked about centralized versus individual, there has been a big push due to the constraints of budget to try to do more under the umbrella of the do it, which is our technology agency. So I'm, I'm just saying that I understand the centralization argument can be a challenge if there are barriers and slowness that uh, results. But I do think that um, agencies need to uh, be somewhat collaborative if there is a resource. How do you how do you answer that question? I I think uh, W3C has a lot of experience in these collaborative processes, and so I think. Uh, and it, giving them a forum uh, for doing so is should be low cost and and would everyone would benefit uh, the and uh, aggregating the information that they publish may be a service to the citizens uh, that can go to one place and find what they need but it should probably not be the only way for them to reach that so it can be a convenience but without sort of hampering the agencies from putting their data online. Okay. So are you working then um, with other municipalities through National League of Cities or U.S. Conference of Mayors or any New York uh, National Association of Legislatures or anything like that to try to work with best practices? 
Is that something that has come up as you talk about e-government? Um, so we're revising the charter of this interest group as we speak, right. and the emphasis on creating a forum for this to, to take place is already built into the draft charter. Um, I have not myself chatted with these agencies. I'm taking notes so that I can go back and find out if okay. we have, but right. um, it's well, certainly our goal to uh, produce sort of okay. best practices. Right. Thank you very much. This is fascinating, and we will the conversation continues. So thank you very thank much. You.